Okay, one is this, we, we, we quite often forget when we discuss Bangladesh is that that, that uh, when the British came to Bangladesh, okay, they came as of a colonial power, okay, they still came into Bangladesh as a colonial power. We know the history of the Lord Clive and the so this history, this narrative is more or less, you know, more or less clear to it. But we often forget that also the, the colonial power has introduced a particular form of the property relation in the subcontinent and which is known as the permanent settlement. So permanent settlement is that you are you are literally taking away the rights of the peasant on the land and a, a kind of zamindari feudal systems have been developed which is which is not like that like say, European feudalism but it's colonial feudalism been imposed on the land and it created a zamindar systems or also at the same time, along with it, a moneylenders, a class of moneylenders, uh, who are exploiters in the eye of the peasantry. Now, this peasantry, majority of them, were Muslims. So, obviously, this Muslim subjectivity is essentially the peasant subjectivity. So, that's why we always get confused. When you say, is the Muslims who are demanding the rights, uh, we forget that this is not the Muslims only. Economically, they are peasantry. So there is a history of the peasant struggle during the colonial period, you know, Hajishwari Yutla struggle, Titimi struggle, all these struggles are essentially peasant struggle against the Zamindar and the Mahajans. So the struggle of the Muslims is the struggle of the peasants, oppressed peasants against the colonialism and also against uh, the, the, the particular property rule that colonialism has imposed in the subcontinent, you know, robbing off the right taking of the right, taking of the right from the land, and thus culminated into Pakistan in 1947. Now, look at the way I'm explaining this thing. It's very important for us to understand. The dominant narrative about the Bangladesh is that someone somewhere has wrote something called two-nation theory, okay? That the whole continent will be divided on the basis of, you know, that there is the Muslims and there is the Hindus, they can live together, so the country has been divided. I am challenging this narrative. I think I, it's not acceptable. This narrative is coming from the from from the secular narrative, and equally interestingly, it also comes from the Islamic narrative, and both are equally wrong, because they have forgotten struggle of the peasantry in that subcontinent, and peasant struggle is essentially a struggle of the Muslims, because you know they are uh, you know. Um, they are, they, are, they are converted to Muslim, and previously there is a long history of the Buddhism in that in that region, and the Buddhists also registered the Aryanization. You know, some intellectuals call it Aryanism, or some call it Brahmanism. So there is a struggle, serious struggle in the subcontinent, as which the the conventional left call them class struggle. Okay, but usually conventional left ignores how the particular subjectivity also gets constituted out of this. Class struggle. They say the only class identity is as only as the peasants. So as if when the Muslims are fighting, so they ignore or they undermine their identity as Muslims. They only reduces into the peasants to struggle. So what I'm doing is methodologically is this: that to see this particular subjective subjectivity, the way they have been constituting, constituted, and also what kind of political challenges they pose to the other uh, um, uh, who are enemy to them. So that's how this dialect has been developed. Thank you.